Can you see the, um, can you see all this? Okay, good. All right, so way back at the start of Organic One, we came across a six-membered ring with three double bonds in it, and the functional group that we called it was an aromatic. And today we're basically going to learn what constitutes aromaticity, what makes it aromatic, and all that sort of interesting things. Now, we can draw a resonance structure for these uh, for aromatic rings in which we can delocalize the double bonds throughout this ring. So if we were to draw this like sort of sideways with our p orbitals, this system has got these six p orbitals that are all lined up and the electrons can effectively zoom around this ring as they please. So each one of these bonds is technically when they've done the when they've done the measurements, so a normal carbon carbon bond is certain length, a normal carbon carbon double bond is a certain length. For an aromatic ring when they do the me the measurements, it comes out to be um exactly one and a half. So it's like 139 picometers. I think a typical double bond is 134 and a typical single bond is 154. So it's some it's somewhere in between. Um, the other interesting thing about aromatic systems is that they have got, uh, they are um, quite stable. So they've got um, added stability compared to an isolated double bond. So if we take, um, say, this and we throw in, uh, no, let's do this one. And, oh, let's, no, let's use bromine. If we were to throw in our bromine, let's use this instead. We would form our dibromide, which would be trans. Sorry, which would be the ant, they'd have the anti addition, so they'd be on either side. If we did the same reaction with benzene and we threw in our molecular bromide and dichloromethane, we get no reaction. So those, the, the fact that those double bonds are conjugated in a cyclic system, they're aromatic, it doesn't, um, it makes them, this molecule, the aromatic ring, is, is less reactive, which means it is more stable. So um, to get this reaction to work, you need to add a catalyst to make the bromine more electrophilic. So um, as a preview of, what to, of what's to come, if we use bromine and a catalyst, and typically the catalyst is iron tribromide. Then we do make a product, but it is this. Not this. So rather than um, make like rather than making the dibromide like a, a, a normal isolated alkene would, it wants to revert to the aromatic ring. So it wants to keep that aromaticity. So aromaticity is going to be a driving force throughout everything we do over this next little this next little section. So rather than being so, if we were to classify this this bromine plus alkene, this is really an addition reaction, right? I almost gave it away by saying it was an addition reaction. So this is an addition reaction. One plus one equals one. So it's the addition reaction. Whereas here, 
what's gone on here is we've substituted an H for a bromine. So this is actually a substitution reaction. So it's, diff it's completely different. So aromaticity is basically changing the rule book for how this works. Okay, now uh, there are uh, three simple rules for um, aromaticity. I was gonna make a joke about a show. Um, and so there are rules for aromaticity and we will do the, those first. And then we're gonna go through a series of compounds and we're gonna do an analysis of them to see whether or not they're aromatic or not. So these rules were developed by rules of aromaticity. Sometimes these are called the Huckel rules. Um, so the first one is um, the hardest one to do an analysis for actually, um, because it's hard to look at something and, and, and know whether or not this happens to be the case. But the first rule is that the molecule must be planar. And uh, so it must be flat. Um, now, chemists, because someone's made a rule, they of course want to break it. So people have developed um, aromatic compounds that uh, are not quite 100% flat. So they've sort of got curvature to them, sort of like the earth, that sort of stuff. So people are working on breaking this one all the time. So it's just, it's, so it's probably the least important of what we're gonna talk about. The second one is it must be a cyclic conjugated system. So this means that there will be a series of uninterrupted uh, p orbitals. So when we have a conjugated system, like I just drew the benzene ring, let's draw it again. The, it's a, cyclic system and there are a bunch of p orbitals and you notice that each carbon, so this is going to equal enzyme, and you'll notice that each carbon has got a p orbital on, to, on it. If we drew the similar system here for this um, cyclopentadiene, um, if we drew this out, and remember, this was our favorite molecule for um, Diels-Alder reactions. Let's draw this out, three dimensions, sort of. One of the carbons here has got two protons on it. So this carbon here with two protons. So the, the uninterrupted series of p orbitals is broken here. So this is broken. So there, this, so this is not aromatic. So you need to have all of these beautiful p orbitals all in a row. So pretty, right? Here, this one is sort of, we've got those two protons there, so there's no p orbital, so it's not aromatic. Now the third rule, is one of simple arithmetic here. And this is that the system contains four N plus two pi electrons. 
where n equals zero or one or two or three or four. So when n equals zero, the pi electrons equal two. When n equals one, the pi electrons equal six, 10, 14, four times four is 16 plus two is 18, right? So as long as it has this number of pi electrons, it will be aromatic. So with benzene, for example, let's draw this out one more time, just because it's so beautiful. We've got one, two, three, four, five, six, six pi electrons. And so it fits the rule. So, so benzene is aromatic. So this means that we could have two pi electrons in a cyclic system or 10 or 14 or 18 and all of these sort of compounds will be aromatic. Now, if you've got a cyclic system which has got um, uh, four n pi electrons, These systems are called anti-aromatic. And they would be uh, very reactive. And so an example of this is uh, a four-membered ring here. Um, let's see if I can draw this proper. So cyclobutadiene, um, so this would equal this. And if we count the electrons here, I'll count them in green. One, two, three, four. So this is four pi electrons. So this would be anti-aromatic, anti And when you do actually a similar sort of analysis, of cyclobutadiene here. This bond is, when they do a bond measurement, this one's like a double bond. And this bond here, the bond length is like a single bond. So it's not like benzene where it, there's, it's, a, it's a, where the um, resonance main, makes all bond lengths like one and a half. They, they actually behave like an isolated single bond and an isolated double bond. And this guy is so reactive that it actually reacts with itself. So if you make it, this will uh, undergo a Diels-Alder reaction with itself. And um, so these electrons would go here, those electrons would go there, and these electrons would go here. And you make a really interesting three-membered uh, cyclic system here where something like this, that just looks, and this, this reaction takes place at minus 78 degrees Celsius. So it's low temperature, it's so reactive. So, um, so three four-membered rings in all lined up and we would know that these would all be, um, the ring junction here would all be like this would be up, this would be up, because this is a cis, and this is probably down. I'm guessing. I'd have to look at that. But anyway, they would be cis. Those two protons would be cis to one another because the maintaining of the stereospecificity, stereospecificity of the diels alder reaction. So there's really. Um, Anti-aromatic compounds have got the 4n pi electron. So if we put the, uh, this would be when n equals 0, 1, 2, 3. The pi electrons would be uh, 0, 4, 8, 12. So these numbers fit right in between 
the aromatic system. So 2, 6, 10, 14, 18, those are the aromatic ones. The antiaromatic ones are 4, 8, 12. So there's really, in this, um, in this section, there's really three types of compounds you could have. You could have um, aromatic compounds. So they follow the Huckel rules. Um, and the, it'll be the 4N plus 2. You can have anti-aromatic. And this would be the 4N rule. And then you can have non-aromatic compounds where one of the other rules is broken. You don't have the uninterrupted series of pi electrons or, um, yeah. So a good example of that was what I'd drawn up here before the uh, cyclopentadiene where we don't have, it doesn't fall, it doesn't even, um, it's got to be that conjugated pi system. So a series of uninterrupted p orbitals. Well, here they're interrupted because there's, there's no pi p orbital there. Okay, so then if we look at, so what we'll do, what I usually do is a little survey of some of the molecules that are out there. Um, and we've already done two of them, like the uh, uh, so cyclobutadiene. This is anti-aromatic. Um, Benzene, this is aromatic. Uh, the next closest one we, we can draw relatively easily is this one. Cyclo tetrene so cyclic system that's why it's cyclo octa because there's eight one two three four five six seven eight and then tetrene because there's four double bonds one two three four so Based upon um, the Huckel rules for the pi electrons, um, this falls into the 4N category, right? Where N equals two, because we've got four um, pi bonds. And remember each pi bond has got, each, each contains, two pi electrons. So four times two equals eight. And this matches this number up here. So that so this is therefore therefore it's going to be anti-aromatic. And in fact, cyclooctatetrine isn't even flat. Uh, if I was to, uh, this is one of the things where it's hard to, um, you, if we draw this guy, it is, um, can I draw it proper? Let's try. Two, four, six. No, it's got to be like this, right? Yeah, this one. Okay, let me draw it the other way. Okay, yeah, this is the way to draw it. Yeah. Double bond there. Double bond there. 
double bond there, double bond there. Right, so there's four uh, cis bonds in this molecule. That's the tricky part about drawing it. So it's not even flat. And um, if you do a reaction with, um, if you do a reaction with Br2 on this one, it reacts right away. And it would make, um, let's just draw it sideways uh, from above because it's easier. It would give you, it would make, it would react just like a normal alkene. So it, it's super reactive and it um, doesn't behave like an aromatic system. So, so that's, and then if we, if we wanted to draw a 10 membered ring, I guess we could do that cyclo, um, that would be an aromatic system. So it would be resistant to, it would be resistant to the normal sort of chemistry that an isolated double bond would be. So, yeah, so the, the thing that people get hooked up on at the start is 4n plus 2. What does n mean? Well, n can be any integer. So it's basically a series starting at 0 all the way up to um, however as high we want to go. So, so for aromatic systems, it's 4n plus 2. Uh, I guess the let's, so you can have um, aromatic straight up molecules, but you can also have aromatic ions. So you can have both cations or anions um, that make up aromatic systems. So we need to have an uninterrupted series of p orbitals, and we need to have the 4n plus 2 pi electron. So that so in benzene, each one of those p orbitals has got one electron in it. But if it was a cation, one of those orbitals could be empty. Or if it was an anion, so this would be empty. Or if it was an anion, it would have two pi electrons in that p orbital. So you can have it can so you can have a, aromatic cations or aromatic anions. And the one we'll talk about first is the example we showed at the start for cyclopentadiene. So cyclo. So this was non-aromatic because there isn't an uninterrupted series of p orbitals. So when we drew this before, we had this proton, proton, ring, ring. So we had one, two, three, four, four p, sorry, four pi electrons. If we wanted to make an aromatic system, we would need this. We would need a orbital here. And how many pi electrons do we need? To make this aromatic. So let's say we converted this got rid of that proton somehow. We either lost it as H plus or we lost it as H minus and we generated a system where we had these five P orbitals. Um, how many electrons would we need to put into this to make it an aromatic system? So remember, at the start, we had one electron here, one, 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 one. So how many do we need? How many do we need here? When it's 4n plus 2. If we put 0 in here, 
then we would have four n electrons, which would be anti-aromatic. So we don't want that. So to make this equal six, so that would be n equals one here. What we need, the number of electrons in this orbital is two, right? So then we'd have two, three, four, five, six, and then we would have an aromatic system. So if we want two electrons in this orbital, what we're gonna do is we're gonna use a base of some type to grab the proton and then these electrons move into that, onto that carbon, right? And this would be hybridized as a sp2 hybrid orbital and you would have an aromatic system. And the interesting thing is that with cyclopentadiene, the pKa of these protons here, pKa, so remember pKa is acid strength, The pKa of this is around approximately nine. So it's less than water. It's, they're that acidic because the moment you lose it, you form an aromatic compound. So aromaticity is making that proton very acidic. And in fact, this, uh, so yeah, if we take that proton away, just let's draw it like this. electrons there, and this would equal uninterrupted series. You put two electrons in this one, 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 and the electrons can zip around the ring and it's a cyclic conjugated system. It's got the appropriate number of pile of, of pi electrons and it's aromatic. And inorganic chemists use this, um, they often draw this when, uh, rather than with isolated double bonds, inorganic chemists draw it like this with a, and a negative charge in it, just to say that it's aromatic. And they use this to make these sort of sandwich compounds with metals like iron. So it makes a sort of a complex with the, Like little, and the I, the metal well, it's it's bonded to both of those ring systems in the middle, so it's like a little sandwich. And you can do a bunch of interesting chemistry on this if you are interested in that sort of stuff. But it's kind of neat that uh, it's a stable anion, which inorganic chemists use to complex to transition metals, and then you can do a bunch of chemistry on the ring systems, and it can change the properties of the center metal and you use these as catalysts and all sorts of super fun stuff. So it's, it's really interesting. So that's an, that's an example of a um, aromatic anion if you deprotonate cyclopentadiene. So that's an anion. We can talk about aromatic cations too. So remember before we always thought of carbocations is super reactive. Um, and in this case, the one we're going to talk about is a seven membered ring here. So cycloheptatriene. Cyclo So triene, three double bonds, cyclo, it's a ring system, seven, seven carbons. Now, in this case, what we need to make is the cation, not the anion. So we need a positive charge here. So we need to lose H minus, not losing H plus like we did before, we need to actually lose H minus. So if you actually, sorry, the pK of um, cyclopentadiene is the same as water. That's not stronger than water. Um, 
So in this case, you want to lose H minus. And um, so somebody once took cycloheptatriene and they tried to react this with um, molecular bromine. And why not? Because this would be a, you'd think, well, we, we would do a reaction with this and we would um, produce, I guess what they were thinking they would make would be this. And it's a reasonable assumption that this would be your product. They used one equivalent. But that's not what they got at all. Um, let's put a big red X through this. No. Um, what they ended up making is this is this is this one right here. And so what ended up happening is if we're gonna draw the arrows here, these this hydride attacked the bromine and this bromine left. And so you ended up with this. Um, aromatic cation plus the other components where there was a counter ion, the, the bromine, bromide, I guess, plus HBr. So the reaction didn't work at all, but you they ended up with this uh, aromatic cation. So in this case, if we're going to redraw this as a with all of our p orbitals, because that seems to be the fun thing to do today. Um, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. This looks beautiful, and we'll put in an electron here. One electron, one, 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 two, three, four, five, six, six high electrons. So this follows the 4n plus 2, where n equals 1. And this last car, this last orbital here is just empty, so it's got a positive charge. So that's uh, a, an example of an aromatic Fun stuff. Okay, now I guess we should. The obvious question might be well, why, right? What's why? Why? And so to basically um, answer this question, the, the why deals with molecular orbital theory. So remember when we had um, our uh, butadiene here, butadiene. And this, if we draw the, the, the p orbitals on this, it's just beautiful. It's got the, it's got, we got these, it's a nice, this isn't a cyclic system, so it's not conjugated, but it's a conjugated system because you've got these uninterrupted series of p orbitals, or you've got this series of p orbitals that are on each, on every carbon. And when we talked about uh, butadiene, there was, because there's four different p orbitals, there's actually four different molecular orbitals which correspond to, for this molecule. And so we drew four of these, um, we drew the four orbitals and we used them to describe how the Diels-Alder reaction took place because it was using the, um, The orbitals that are being used by the diene and the dienophile were the highest occupied molecular orbital and the lowest unoccupied molecular orbital. And so there was, because you had four p orbitals, 
And when you made your molecular orbitals, it'd be four molecular orbitals. So there's this thing called the conservation of orbitals. So um, in this system, there was four molecular orbitals and um, we've got four P electrons. So it's only the bottom two that were occupied. And this is the highest occupied molecular orbital. And this is the lowest unoccupied molecular orbital. And the rule we had when we went, so the, the bottom molecular orbital, the lowest energy is the easiest because all of the orbitals are in phase, right? And then I said, every time you go up a level, you add a nodal plane to it where the phase changes. So in this one, there's a nodal plane there, then there was two, and then the last one, there was three. And you could make your molecular orbitals as long as you uh, changed phase in between each nodal plane, you could make these guys. So it's all very, very cool. Now, in a cyclic system, there is what well, we can do the exact same thing here. We'll do it for benzene because we'll do it. We'll do two examples. We'll do benzene and um, cyclobutadiene. Okay. So with benzene, you will notice that, um, okay. You will notice that there are one, two, three, four, five, six P orbitals. So if there's six P orbitals, we need six molecular orbitals. Um, now, the lucky thing is that four of these molecular, uh, there's a couple of molecular orbitals that are uh, degenerate, so they're the same energy, and this is gonna be important. Um, now, coming up with these six molecular orbitals is a bit harder because it's a cyclic system, but I'll show you what to do anyway. So, um, there's a neat little trick for determining where the, the relative energy of the molecular orbitals is. And this is using what we would call frost, frost circles. So, what you do is you draw a circle. I'm going to use my special little paint this shape. Yes. Good. Look at that. Beautiful. All right. I'll turn that off. And if you were to draw your ring inside the circle, and the key point is that you always put the pointy end at the bottom. So we're gonna draw a six membered ring in this circle like this. Oh, it's a bit ugly there. And this basically tells you the various levels of your molecular orbitals. So with benzene, there are um, six molecular orbitals and it looks just like the ring. Um, and if we fill up our, uh, so the bottom half of this circle, the bottom half is basically the bonding orbitals. And the top half is the antibonding. If there's something right in the middle, it's basically a non-bonding orbital, and that makes it uh, reactive, so to speak. Well, it can make it reactive. Now, the key point, though, is that when you've, I'm just going to redraw this without the, um, sorry, I'm going to redraw these energy levels without the ring or anything. Actually, no, I'll keep the ring just because it might be helpful. No, I won't. I'll just draw the orbitals here. So we've got six pi electrons, right? We have six pi electrons. And if we fill it up, one, and we use Offenbaugh's principle, fill from the bottom first, one, 
two, three, four, five, six. You'll notice that all the bonding orbitals are filled. So that's going to make it stable, right? Now let's do a frost circle for cyclo. Uh, so this one here was this one. So let's do a frost circle for cyclobutadiene. Now, remember, you always put the pointy end down. So if we were to draw our square inside here, and let's get rid of the little line. Oh, darn it. Okay, I'm not going to dare try to erase that. Okay, so our orbitals are going to be, our molecular orbitals are going to be here here, here, and here. And so let's draw them out by themselves. One, two, three, four. And for cyclobutadiene, there is four pi electrons. So if we fill up our orbitals, one, two, three, Four. And look at this, you've got two unfilled orbitals. So this is going to make it reactive. So you can do a similar analysis of all of the various ring systems and the same thing happens each time. You get, for all the anti-aromatic compounds, you have these unfilled uh, orbitals and for all of the aromatic compounds you've got filled orbitals and so you'll notice here that the unfilled orbitals are these ones right in the middle so these would be non-bonding orbitals so that's going to make it more and they're the highest molecular like they're the highest occupied molecular orbital which is the orbital which will do the attacking so so th that makes these systems very um, reactive we could let's do the cyclo let's do the cyclopentadiene one just cyclo pentadienyl cation I mean anion so let's do this one so this is an aromatic this is the aromatic This guy. Okay, so let's draw our frost circle. Shoot, ink. Okay, now the next part, which so you always put the pointy end down, and let's put this draw this in the middle here. There we go. Now, and so our Levels for the orbitals will be here, 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 and here. Oops. Here. So, and the the anti-bonding bonding barrier or uh, place is somewhere in like here, like halfway through. So this is an interesting case. In, in fact, you've got three bonding orbitals and two antibonding orbitals. And so if we fill this up with six electrons, one, two, three, four, five, six, the, uh, the bonding orbitals are filled. So uh, Y is pointy and down. So I've always said when we've got a, a, a 
when you're generating these frost circles, why do you put the pointy end down? Why does this rule make sense? Because if we are drawing the molecular, if we're drawing the molecular orbitals of say, um, oh, we'll draw this one here. So we draw our molecular orbitals. Remember, the lowest energy orbital is always the one where this is entirely in phase. And so that's the lowest energy. And that one will be the one at the very bottom here. So whenever you've got, even with the, this four membered ring one here, if we were to draw the molecular orbitals of this, the lowest energy uh, one is always gonna be where they're all in phase with one another. So that's always gonna represent the bottom one. So that's why the pointy end is, is down because there's always one molecular orbital where all of the P orbitals are in phase and that's the easiest one to draw. So that's, that's where that goes. Um, so yeah, the reason why that the 4n plus rule works, 4n plus two rule works, it deals with molecular orbitals and it deals with the fact that the molecular orbitals in these instances, all the bonding orbitals are filled with electrons. Um, and with the anti-bonding systems, you'll always have those the highest molecular orbital or orbitals because they'll have equal energy will be unfilled. So that's or, um, like have one electron in them. So that will make them more reactive. That's basically how that works. So the other, um, I guess the next question is, do you have any questions on this? Um, I didn't draw out all of the various uh, orbitals for benzene. I guess we could do that um, just for, I don't know if it's really that important in all honesty. Um, if you are in, take the group theory class, you'll see like with benzene, the, I guess we could do it with benzene just for benzene, just to get a clear picture. So the, the lowest orbital, which we've drawn, everything will be in phase. So all of these will be in phase. So that's the lowest orbital. Then there's, as you go up, there's two other orbitals here and here. And so there'll be one nodal plane and these are degenerate orbitals, but they aren't, when they say that they're degenerate, so they're the same energy, but they're not, they don't look equivalent. So here's one of them and the nodal plane will pass right through the center here. So on one side, we will have one phase up and on the other side of that nodal plane, the one phase will be down. So that will be this orbital with two. The other degenerate orbital, which I'll draw on the other side here, looks like this. And in this case, the nodal plane passes through two carbon atoms. And so its orbitals look like this. They're the same energy, but they are, so one side, this will be in phase and the other side will be down. That one will be filled. Um, yeah, now let's see here. Then the one at the top is the easiest because it is everything is out of phase in this one. So we've got no, we've got and going through here, through here, through here. So every single orbital, there's a crosses phase there. down, up, down, up, down. 
And then the two third of the, the ones in here, I have to remember which those ones look like actually. Perfectly honest, I think that is. Something like this. That seems right. Could be wrong though. And here we would draw a nodal plane. Keep that one the same, draw another one there, and something like this. I think that's right. I could be wrong. Um, but the these four of the six are definitely right. So that's basically the way that it works. If you take, if you take, um, yeah, if you do group theory class, you'll learn how to draw all the molecular orbitals properly. Um, but for what we're doing, the key point, the only reason why drawing all this is I wanted to show you that, um, particularly in the second row here between these two, is that the, these electrons are, they've got the same energy, but the, um, you'll notice that a one, case on the left hand side you've got three orbitals in each side and the other one you've only got two and that's fine like that's the, the key point there okay now um the last thing that we typically do in this section is talk about um aromatic heterocycles So what heterocycle means here is that there is um, an atom other than carbon. So for example, one of our favorite um, bases that we talked about in the all throughout um, organic one was this one here. So this is pyridine. So pyridine has got a, um, doesn't smell particularly good and you probably shouldn't be smelling it because it's um, not good for you when you do smell it. Now, the question is, is pyridine, is pyridine aromatic? And I suppose the answer to this depends upon where you put those um, lone pair electrons here. So uh, let's draw this out in three dimensions so we can see where those lone pairs are. So the question is, are those lone localized or delocalized. If they're a localized lone pair, then pyridine is going to be aromatic. If they're delocalized, pyridine will not be because if we count the pi electrons just from those double bonds, we've already got six, right? So let's draw out pyridine sort of flat and put in our orbitals. So these are the orbitals that we've got our pi electron here, 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 pi electron here. So we currently have six pi electrons. 
Where are the lone pairs? What type of orbital are those lone pairs in? Are they in a p orbital? Are they in a, what type of orbital are they in? This is gonna take you back to the start of organic one. Anybody? What type of orbital would those high electrons be in? I mean, sorry, those, those lone pairs be in. Okay, so if we've got, um, so let's draw these electrons here. So they can't be in the, uh, the P, because the, we've got this double, like remember this purity, and let's draw the resonance structure, this, Right, they're in an sp2. These things are in an sp2 hybrid orbital because that nitrogen is sp2 hybridized, right? It's It's got, um, so all of the sigma bonds are sp2 hybridized. Um, that means that the lone pair has to be in the remaining bond, which isn't there. So it is in an sp2 hybrid orbital. So Pyridine follows the Huckel rule in the sense you got four and sorry six pi electrons, which is four n plus two, where n equals one. But the lone pair is in that sp two hybrid orbital, which means it is localized, and it's going to be the lone pair which goes out and, and uh, so it's going to be reactive. So pyridine is aromatic. So that's a key point. Now let's draw another let's draw another heterocycle here. This heterocycle here is parole. Now the next question is is Parole aromatic. And for this, we got to think about in what type of orbital is that lone pair? What type of orbital is that lone pair in? So, yes, let's ask, let's pose that question because that is the answer to the question. That's going to. So we've got some people voting SP3, some people voting P. So remember our, um, remember our, when we were talking about resonance, if I was to draw, say this compound here, one of the rules for resonance for when we were doing um, structure recognition or pattern recognition is that 
if you've got an allylic lone pair, so a lone pair, which is on the carbon beside the double bond, you could delocalize this to make a resonance structure. And now we'd have the electrons here, and that would be negative, and this would be plus. And so one of the things about um, resonance structures, remember it was only the movement of pi and lone pair electrons. So we were only moving pi electrons and lone pair electrons. Um, no atoms moved. So if I was to ask the hybridization of this nitrogen, uh, what is the hybridization here? What would be the answer? Is it sp3? Is it sp2? It is sp2. Why? Because in this resonance structure here, you need a p orbital, right? You need a p orbital to make that double bond. So in sp3 hybrid structures, you don't have any p orbitals. So this nitrogen needs that p orbital to make this double bond here to be delocalized in this fashion. So because um, an sp3 hybrid orbital, what a you are you're tetrahedral. In sp2, you're what trigonal planar. So if if, pi elect if, if a resonance structure is only the movement of lone pair and pi electrons and no atoms move, that means that if this resonance structure, this nitrogen is trigonal planar, that means that over on the left-hand side, that resonance structure, that nitrogen has to be trigonal planar, which means it has to be sp2 hybridized. So when it comes to parole, well, the reason why we're doing a little review on this is that when we look at parole, that means that when we draw this five-membered ring, I'll redraw everything here, parole. So remember, we could draw resonance structures of this where we delocalize this there and move that there. We would have done that. If this nitrogen now has a double bond, this means that this nitrogen must have P orbital. That means that over here, this nitrogen must have a P orbital. So your hybridization doesn't change during resonance. So if we were to draw everything out, put the nitrogen here, the ring. Let's put in our electrons, one, two, three, four. And nitrogen's lone pair is here in that p orbital. So we've got a grand total of six pi electrons. Therefore, 4n plus 2, where n equals 1. Therefore, aromatic. So there's a series like so the and that, okay so and then if just to carry back to one final point, that means that this bond here is sp two, 
for the nitrogen. This bond here is sp2. This bond here is sp2. All of those bonds, the sigma bonds that nitrogen's making is using, it, nitrogen is using its sp2 orbital. Hydrogen, of course, would be using its s orbital. So that means that, um, yeah, there's a series of different uh, hetero, like uh, aromatic heterocycles that, um, so you, you gotta be, um, develop a picture of where, like that, the lone pairs, are they localized or are they delocalized? Um, so, cause that's gonna help determine whether or not something's aromatic or not. So if, if we're looking, if we're comparing pyridine to parole, So we've established that both are aromatic compounds. And then if we, I should have made this a top hat question. Maybe we'll do it on, on what day is it today? Say it's Thursday. Maybe we'll do it on Tuesday. But if I was to put one molecule of H plus, one atom of H plus into this, you've got, you've got pyridine and you've got parole. Which of those two is going to react with H plus fastest? Will it be pyridine or will it be parole? Now you could have answered this question back in organic one actually, but you would have used a different concept to come to the conclusion. But now we can use aromaticity to come to the conclusion. We've got one answer for pyridine. It is pyridine. Okay, so if we had a competition here, this would be, this is gonna react quicker. Uh, now, Now in organic one, we would have said the reason why pyridine at reacts quicker is that if you think about its lone pair, pyridine's lone pair is localized. Parole's lone pair is delocalized. Because you can draw resonant structures with pyridines, with parole's lone pair. You can't with pyridine because pyridine's lone pair is perpendicular to the aromatic system. So the aromatic system's here and its lone pair is 90 degrees, right? It can't overlap with that system. So it is, it is localized. So in organic one, we would have said, well, it's pyridine because it's a localized lone pair, so it can react, whereas paroles is delocalized, so it can't react. Now, the other reason why this, um, we could think about this, the organic two answer, is that, um, let's talk about aromaticity here. When pyridine reacts with that proton, we would form, let's draw the conjugate acid here. And let's draw a parole when it gets protonated. Okay, so is the conjugate base of pyridine aromatic? And is the conjugate base of parole, sorry, the conjugate acid of parole aromatic? So 
So is this guy here aromatic? One, two, three, four, five, six. Right, so pyridine is aromatic, yes. Is parole's conjugate acid aromatic? Let's draw a little picture of it here to make it more obvious. Oops. Plus. Do we have an uninterrupted series of p orbitals anymore? No, right, we don't. So is so the answer is no. So when when um if parole gets protonated, it's gonna break the aromaticity. So it's um less far less basic than pyridine. So pyridine will be a so when pyridine reacts, it's still got its aromaticity, it's still aromatic once it's been protonated. But parole, now all of a sudden that lone pair is used to make is formed a bond, it's got a positive charge. Um, so it is a non-aromatic compound because uh, there isn't that uninterrupted series of p orbitals anymore because there's a proton there. Um, let's see here. So there's a question about what makes the the pyridine. I mean, sorry, the nitrogen sp2 hybridized in this case back here versus say nh3 the difference is that so this one would be sp3 hybridized and it would be tetrahedral because this these lone pairs can't be delocalized anywhere whereas with the example here in green which i drew those lone pairs it's an allylic lone pair so you can draw a resonance structure and when they're delocalized they have to be in a p orbital to make that to make the double bond which is here because you need a p orbital to make that double bond so the difference is they can be delocalized in a if there's a air they can be delocalized in a resonance structure compared to say ammonia which there is not there is no delocalization there so yeah that's the the last little bit of this section is really about aromatic um heterocycle so you there's there's things you can do you can look at uh my what you might want to do before tuesday's class because we'll we'll do some top hat questions on this is think of some of these sort of compounds here and determine to yourself whether or not you believe that these would be aromatic or this is furan and this one here is thiophene. Um, sort of draw out little three-dimensional drawings with uh, like, like this or like this, and just get a sense of where I'm gonna put the various electrons. Um, and determine if, if they can be delocalized, remember, once they can be delocalized, then they have to be in a p orbital. And that will um, set up us. And so these, like, for example, I've got two lone pairs here. One, two sets of lone pairs here. One, two. That doesn't mean that they're both the same. 
one can be in one space, whereas the other can be in the, in a completely different space. So, um, so yeah, think of think of these various differences where they might be in a diagram. Uh, and there's like there's a ton of different um, heteroatoms. Things like this one here, midazole. One of my fav personal favorite heteroatoms for some reason. I don't know why, but. So yeah, just take a look at them and do an analysis on them and see if they are aromatic or not. More often than not, they are aromatic. And it's just figuring out which electrons contribute to the aromaticity and which ones don't. So. Um, but that's what we'll do. We'll, we'll do a little um, thing with that on top hat on Tuesday. But basically, that's the rules of aromaticity. Um, it's pretty that the three rules are molecule must be planar. Sometimes that's hard to see, but conjugated a cyclic conjugated system. So the p orbitals have to be uninterrupted. So that's super important. And then the 4n plus 2 rule, where n equals any integer. So when n equals 0, there'd be 2 pi electrons. When n equals 1, there'd be 6. When n equals 2, there'd be 10, etc. So there are some large, there are some large systems here. Let me see. So this one here has got two, four, six, eight, ten, twelve, fourteen. So this is an aromatic system, very large. Um, people have synthesized this. They've done lots of neat little stuff with it. It's a very, um, so there's, they built really big aromatic system. So that's just one of them. Um, and with regard to the molecular orbital theory, uh, with regard to the sort of the frost circles and stuff, I really put that in just to show how to, um, why certain compounds are, why the anti-aromatic compounds are so reactive versus the aromatic ones, why are they resistant to a lot of the chemistry that a normal double bond would react readily with. And it's because of the filled or unfilled molecular orbitals. So that's, um, I don't think I've ever asked anyone to construct a frost circle. So if you're a bit confused by that, don't worry about it. Um, but being able to do an analysis of a heterocycle to determine whether or not it's aromatic or not, yeah, you want to be able to do that. So, as I said, uh, take a look at, um, like, say, furan or thiophene or even imidazole for that matter. Draw them out and determine which type of, what type of electrons those ones might be versus like these ones here, because some will contribute to aromaticity, some won't. And if you get that part wrong, then the whole system sort of falls apart. So this is sort of a review of, uh, at the start of Organic One, when we were doing uh, resonance structures. And um, the key point is that the, the shape of the molecule doesn't change in a resonance structure. So if something is trigonal planar, it's got to stay trigonal planar. Though we might only draw it in a, like usually we can just look at something and say, oh, nitrogen with three bonds. That means it's tetrahedral uh, or sp3. Careful, if there's a double bond here and it can be delocalized, then the normal rule of just being able to look at something and seeing if it's got a double bond falls apart because there's a resonance structure which we haven't drawn, which does have a double bond. So that means it has to be sp2. So just keep that in mind. All right, it looks like I've gone over, but uh, yeah, I'll uh, 
look at these things and we'll do a little fun thing at the start of the next class. But until then, have a good weekend. And if you have any questions, just send me an email. Okay. Alrighty. And I'll get this posted as soon as possible.